Well, good morning, Neath Church. It's a good thing nothing awkward or weird has happened today. That's a fun thing. Um, for those of you who have questions and you don't want to wait till October 6th, you can reach me in a variety of ways because I'm sure that some of you have questions like, what's your favorite food? <laughs> what's my favorite football team? That's a tricky one. It's kind of hard to figure out. Um, yeah, undefeated still. That's, that might be the last time I can say that to you. We'll see how that goes. Um, but in all seriousness, you may have questions, and rightfully so. You can ask them right now. I mean, not like right now, right now. Um, my phone number, 570-267-8142. Feel free to call. If you call and I can't pick up, there will be times I can't leave a message, okay? So I know who it is. I get calls all the time telling me that I can get financing on my house, you know, those types of calls. So I generally don't pick up certain phone calls. So leave a message so I know it's you. You can text me at that same number. You can find me on Facebook. There's all sorts of ways that you can reach out to me and ask me questions because I want to make sure that I address those and then we'll see what God does. We are trusting that God will make clear what he would have for us as a church and what he would have for me. So. Let's just pray, do ask your questions, and we'll see what God would do for us here. First Timothy chapter 3 is where we are. In the back, you may not have seen it, uh, but there's a little note sheet for you. If you are interested in getting one, they are on the back table down uh, where the uh, bulletins are, and you can see what the notes are because you can see, man, that's a whole lot of stuff in there. And I remember how late last week went. This is why I'm giving you notes, so that you can kind of refer to them and make sure that we don't spend as much time on that. Just uh, make sure that you have everything that we go through today. We we're talking in 1 Timothy chapters 2 and following about first things first when it comes to church. Things that God cares about and the way that the church is supposed to be run and the people who run the church. Um, Tom was telling me about a pastor, I, I, this was years ago, I guess, was it here or was it somewhere else, about the pastor who preached on a message about what a pastor looks like, and then he said, oh, by the way, that's me. Um, I'm not doing that today, so please don't, don't think that's what this is or why I did this. I really wanted to focus on a couple of things that this passage reminds us are crucial when it comes to God's house. It is God's house. He, it's his rules. It's his standard. It's his call on the way that things are supposed to be done. So we saw right up front, God wants his people to pray. And that has been a very important emphasis here at the church. And I really love the fact that the women's are praying for the kids as they go to school. That's a really awesome thing. And being able to do things like that on a regular basis, even on an impromptu basis, being a people of prayer, that's what God desires. Because God desires everyone to be saved, to come to that knowledge of the truth, because there is only one way, there is only one Savior. Jesus himself said, few, is, few are the ones who find the way to eternal life. And if that's the case, and the church is the care keeper, the I can talk gooder today, is the caretaker of the message. We got to make sure that we are all about the message. So being on point in that emphasis, talking about Jesus as the way, there's only one payment, there's only one ransom, there's only one path to heaven. Then we saw the character of those who pray, the importance of the types of people who pray. And it's not just that those who meet these qualifications should be the only ones who pray. We should strive to pray with lifting holy hands, men, that we don't quarrel, that we don't fight, that we don't bring our baggage into a prayer life. And ladies, as you pray, make sure that you are focusing on the internal qualities. Now, he's going to talk more about that here in this section of, of uh, 1 Timothy 3. But God cares about our character and our reputation, and we'll see that even more today. After that, he transitions into leadership roles. And last week, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen how God uh, spoke through the Apostle Paul to kind of limit a position in the church to men. By the way, not to men in general, to specific ones, only ones who meet 
qualifications because it's not about establishing a patriarchy. It's about establishing people of character. It's got to be that because we've seen and heard about pastors who have broken bad. They get into a church, they just, and things derail from there because their character is not what God desires it to be. And that leads us to this passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at today in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. But before we get there, I want to talk about cats. Now, it's kind of hard for you to see here. This cat is an orange cat. Looks like, um, if you remember Oscar the cat, okay, from some of those commercials, you're old enough to remember television commercials back on primetime. You know, it's us, it's that kind of cat. He's a fun cat, his name's called Bowser. And if you know Bowser from Nintendo, Mario, he is as destructive and violent as that, but just in a playful way, as cats can be. Bowser is our cat, we've had him for uh, six years now. Um, he's been a part of our house, and of course, when we went back to campus, we couldn't take him with him. But now that we're back in the house, he's our cat, he's adjusted well, but there's a problem. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a door there, and there's something sticking out underneath the door. Okay? So, and, and now there's two. And just in case you couldn't see what it was before, here's a different angle sticking out right there. What you have is not just Bowser the orange cat, you now have Casper and Gizmo, two black cats. And those black cats belong to Bethany, our daughter. And those were sympathy cats because she was having a really tough time and she played on the emotions of mom and dad. Can I get some kittens? Look at these cute kittens. And they're like, okay, you can have some kittens. You know, we were kind of feeling it too. And we wanted, you know, a little emotional support kitten. And, you know, the kittens were really cute. And so we were in Michigan. We got the pictures. Here's the kittens. Do you want the kittens? Yeah, we'll take the kittens. And then the kittens were gone and given to somebody else. And so now Bethany's, I want kittens. And she put it out there on Facebook, which is the wrong place to put it. Um, Because immediately we got notified by one of my former students. No, this was, it it was a God thing, to be sure. I wish God hadn't done it. (laughs) That's that's just one of those. You've ever had things like that happen in your life where God brings something in and just says, here's how you're going to grow. And and this was one of those things where God brought these, you know, over one-year-old cats. They're no longer kittens. They're established, so what we've had to do is introduce them slowly. So her cats live downstairs. Bowser lives upstairs with the good, smart people, the wise people. Um, not that Bethany's not wise or smart. Don't, don't tell her I said that. But just, you know, she loves those cats. She has a great time with them. But you can't just throw cats together. Because what happens when you do that? Exactly, Tony. Have you seen that before? Have you heard that before? And, and it sounds just like that, because every once in a while we still hear that, because all of a sudden somebody says, hi, you know, and when cats say hi, there's usually something pointing out. But what has been so fun, because we are now at the point where they're upstairs during the day. They're kind of figuring it out. And they'll run around and chase each other at times, and then they'll just kind of fall down because they're exhausted, because they're cats, you know, they're not meant to run around like that all the time. In the morning, when I wake up, Chris and I are the earliest wakers in the morning, this is what we see. Pause. Trying to get out from under the doorstep, trying to get upstairs. And if we don't come right away, they get forceful, (laughs) you know. Like Jerome Bettis trying to break through the door, a Kool-Aid man moment with the door. And then you hear the pathetic, please, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just like, okay, 
I did it today. You know, I got up, you know, before 7 o'clock. I was up getting stuff done, walking around, making sure that certain things were taken care of upstairs. And you know how cats can be. They can hear all sorts of things. And so as soon as I walk out there, please, you know, that kind of thing. I'm like, I don't know. We're going to be gone. No one's going to be home going to church and everything else, and sure enough, wound up letting the door open because they really wanted to be upstairs. They want that fellowship. Paul starts off this section of Scripture talking about the want to be a pastor and people who want it and desire it. And he starts off with this, and remember, he's writing around A.D. 60, 61, somewhere in that time frame, give it a couple years. He's writing to, to Timothy, who's a minister in Ephesus. He's establishing the elders there, but they don't have a seminary. They don't have a school where people go and train. Seminaries are relatively new things within church history. There was nothing like that. What they needed were people who knew the truth of God's word, the Old Testament, because the New Testament's being written, it's being sent around, it's different. It's, it's very different than how you publish books today. You know, someone writes a book, they publish it, it gets sent out to the presses, and within a couple months you can have a physical copy. And nowadays, we have digital things. Somebody writes a book and it can go out like that. That's not how it was back then. So the New Testament stuff is still getting circulated, still getting written, still getting distributed, but it's not collected in the same way that you and I might collect writings and books and all of that thing. So you needed to have people who knew the truth of God's word, the Old Testament, and were able to teach the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel that, that God loved the world and gave his only son and how we're supposed to live in light of that and keeping on track with the message. It was an exciting thing. It was a stressful thing. It was a hard thing. But for those who were like, I want to be able to tell people about Jesus, praise the Lord, everyone should do that. And then there were people like, I want to teach others what this looks like. And Paul said, that's a really good thing, but. In this chapter, the beginnings of it, verse, the first 13 verses, are all about the, the exceptions. It is good that people want to serve, but we want to make sure the right people serve. Because it's not just what you know, it's not just how you can teach. It's how you live. It's who you are that makes a huge difference. So Paul writes these things to Timothy. You can't go to the seminary and get their latest graduates. They're not there. You can't go around and find the local itinerant pastors in the way that you can today, although, you know, Nita's found out how fun that can be. It's different. In many ways, you're pulling from the people in the town in which you're ministering. And certainly certain people would have knowledge, certain people would have information, certain people would be gifted at teaching, and certain people should have nothing to do with serving in leadership. So Paul starts off with this first. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. And the office of overseer, and it depends on your version, your, your section of Scripture as to what word is used here. In other passages of Scripture, you have the word overseer and elder and pastor, shepherd, used interchangeably. Some denominations, some traditions use those terms interchangeably to talk about one office. Others kind of split and differentiate between what an elder looks like versus what potentially some churches use the term bishop rather than overseer, and just so on and so forth. You can get lost in the weeds of that. And I don't want to get lost in the weeds as much as I want to tell you what the main point of this is. Because Paul gives 15 qualifications. This is what he should look like. 
He doesn't give a list of roles and responsibilities. It's obvious Timothy probably knew what that was supposed to be. You can infer some of those roles and responsibilities from the the qualifications that are listed here. But I want to make sure that you catch this because this is the point of the message. Character matters. Character matters. If there's somebody who has poor character or is demonstrating something that is not quite right, something needs to be done because character matters. And as you go into this list, and it is quite the list, you'll see some things here that are like, boy, that's kind of weird that it's written that way. Remember, Paul's writing to a first century audience with first century issues. If he were writing in 21st century to a 21st century audience, he would use some different language to describe some things. For example, he talks about not being addicted to wine. He might expand that today as to what that might look like because wine is not the only addictive substance that would defer someone's mental capacity. Um, It's like people would say, well, Jesus never condemned homosexual marriage in the scriptures. You're right. That wasn't really a thing in first century. And he did talk about those types of issues anyway when you actually look at the context and the things that he said. He addressed it in a first century setting. If he was speaking in a 21st century setting, he might choose different language. But let's see if we can figure out what it is that Paul is painting here. I was going to put up some pictures of some pastors, you know, you know, Dr. David Jeremiah. You know, is that what a pastor looks like? You know, with the suit and the tie and everything else. Then I was going to put up a, a, a picture of a pastor, you know, with uh, just the jeans and the t-shirt. You know, is, is that what a pastor looks like? And then I was going to get this heavy tatted guy, you know, big bushy beard, you know, and, and all, the, all the earrings and stuff and the piercings and all that stuff. Is that a pastor? Because sometimes that's what we think of a pastor. This is what a pastor looks like. We think of those externals. And Paul wants us to make sure that we focus on the internals. So this is what he writes. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 and following. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Oh, I'm trying to advance the clicker on my computer. It didn't quite work. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be thought of well by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil." Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we look at these things that Paul wrote to Timothy, I pray we would see your heart, that we would see the importance of the right people in leadership. Here at this church, there are so many good quality people. I've been blessed to know them the past two years. That's not true for every church. And for some, as we look around the room, we're encouraged by the types of people that are here, but God, there are those that are really struggling with finding those who could meet those roles and responsibilities. So God, I pray that we would understand the importance of the right person, that we would never be tempted to lower the standard just because it doesn't look like anyone can hit it. Father, we're never given permission to do that, and Paul doesn't give permission here either. So I pray that you would use this passage not to just remind us of what these positions look like, but for our own heart, for our own walk with God, for our own reputation in the community. God, help us to learn that character matters. And it will make a huge difference if we can match it up with the message correctly. So God, give us insight and understanding as we look at this passage, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
He starts off talking with people being above reproach, to have nothing in the character or conduct for which someone can be blamed. You can dig into this in such a way that all of a sudden no one is able to meet the standard. But ultimately, you need to make sure that you understand that someone is living rightly in the moment so that no one can say, you know what, he's a bad dude. Paul, let's consider Paul. What was Paul before he was a Christian? A Pharisee, a zealot. What else did he do? Killed people, persecuted the church. Pastor, how about that? Can I introduce you and Paul as a pastor? He was a teacher. By the way, it's funny because you can get lost in the weeds. Again, when you look at passages like this and, and stretch out certain things, we'll talk about that with the husband of one wife, uh, what it looks like. Paul's never called an elder. He's never called an overseer. He's an apostle. He's different. He falls into a different category altogether. But we sometimes lose our mind when it comes to above reproach that because we don't like the person, we use that above reproach thing to just dismiss somebody. Rather than, okay, maybe I'm missing the point. You know, this guy did have a checkered past. Maybe this was a while ago and he's grown. By the way, we all grow. We all mature. We all learn. It's amazing sometimes in politics. This will be the last time I mention politics, okay? Candidates get called into question for something they believed in and fought for 20 years ago. Like they can't change their mind? They can't get new information and grow? Isn't this what we do throughout our entire life? We learn new things, we change, we grow, we mature, we develop a different understanding, and all of a sudden, ah, I might think differently about this issue now. Maybe those Philadelphia Eagles aren't so bad. There you go. See, all those things, you can get to a point where you're measured. Maybe the Dollar General as a shopping district isn't so bad. You know, that, all of those things, you can learn, see, you can learn and grow over your life. So above reproach isn't that there's nothing in the past that can say, uh-uh. Is there something now that kind of stands out that just says warning flag? And by the way, that's how I tend to look at these things. What kind of flags do you get when you look at somebody? When you listen to somebody? When you watch somebody? Is there like, uh... And honestly, it might be best to see this word above reproach in the things that follow next, in the characters and the character qualities that are listed here. The same word for above reproach is used in 1 Timothy chapter 5 when he talks about those that are truly widows and those that are living in a way that is above reproach, that the church ought to care for those who are in a time of distress in which they cannot care for themselves. However, you do not want to care for those and provide for those so that they can live in a lifestyle that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And basically, you don't want to be supporting sin and sinners. That's, that's what Paul was getting at. And again, this is a first century context. It is so very different today what that looks like. But back then, they understood the importance of caring for widows and orphans in their time of distress. There were limited resources. They wanted to make sure they used them wisely, so let's look for those that are living in a way that is above reproach. He talks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, speaking specifically to Timothy, that you ought to conduct yourself in such a way that you live above reproach so that no one can give an accusation against you. And then he goes into these qualifications. And I'm just going to put them up here on the screen. Again, there's notes in the back. You can see pretty much the same things that are there. He is to be the husband of one wife. The word or the phrase in the Greek is actually one woman man. And this used to mean a whole lot of different things depending on where you grew up. Usually it meant, and by usually I mean this was not too long ago in church history, it meant you could not be divorced because that's what it meant to be a one-woman man, that you, had never, that you had never been unfaithful, been accused of unfaithfulness. 
Um, And then something happened within church history that kind of made it hard to keep this position and not call certain people naughty. And I won't bore you with the list of names, but some of you have heard them. And all of a sudden, you had well-known, recognized pastors and theologians who had been divorced. And people started to go back and look at the phrase and think, maybe this doesn't say what we think it says. And honestly, I don't think it ever said that. And there are different ways that you can try and interpret it. Really, what we're talking about is, is he faithful? Is he a man of faithful, moral character? Whether he has a wife or not, is he acting in a morally faithful way in that relationship? Because there's a way you can act that when you're married. I only have eyes for you kind of thing. There's a way you act when you're not married. I don't have eyes for, you know, those things. That makes sense? Paul is talking about the character of the man. He's not a womanizer. He doesn't do one at a time. Like, it's Tuesday night, and I got my guest, best girl for Tuesday. Now it's Friday night, and now I got my Friday night. You know, he's not like Solomon in that way. I'm not sure Solomon was that way, but Solomon just just say he didn't meet this qualification. One woman man, morally faithful. Does this mean that someone who's divorced potentially could be an elder? Potentially. What we mentioned last week and a couple weeks before, there's going to be some issues. And the longer that Jesus tarries, the more things will get tricky and complicated in some of these things. There was a church near us in the summit area in which a pastor who was widowed married a woman who divorced her previous husband due to marital unfaithfulness. That caused a stir within the the community. Not within the church. The church knew them, knew the situation, and they were to the point where we're okay. But certain people outside of the church were not okay. And one of them reached out to me and said, what do you think should be done? And I said, I think if the church wants to move forward with this, praise the Lord. Let the church determine if he meets the qualifications for the pastor of the church and if this particular relationship fits within that. Praise the Lord. But don't you think he should be above reproach? Again, there's that standard. There's that, you know. She didn't divorce him because he burnt the toast. He had already violated the vow. There is a clause for that in Scripture. And again, you can get lost in the weeds, but it's so easy to sometimes use this in a way that you weaponize Scripture. And this isn't about weaponizing Scripture to talk about that. This is, Timothy, as you're thinking of the people who will help your church move forward, look for the morally faithful. Don't look for the womanizer. Don't look for the one who has a bad reputation who gives people the creeps, who fill in the blank, whatever vernacular you would use that would just set off the warning flags that there's a problem. Make sense? He starts there. Because that is, and that was, still an issue with people. Can you trust them to be faithful in their relationship, their most intimate relationship? How you live your life before marriage affects it while you're married. Sober-minded, not given to rash emotional responses, able to think clearly. This doesn't mean that there aren't emotional responses, but he's not governed by them in such a way that he cannot, in the moment, pause and cause, choose what's right. Again, we're not talking perfection, but is he to the standard where you could just say, okay, this is him, this is who he is. Self-controlled, not given to rash physical responses, able to react or act purposefully. Chris, I've told this story one time watching the Steelers game with my terrible towel in hand. He knows because he's seen the damage. He wasn't there. He saw the aftermath of the there. 
And hopefully he remembers how truly sorry I was in the moment. But the Steelers did what the Steelers do. They made a boneheaded play. I had my terrible towel in the hand, and I whipped that thing. It was fantastic. It made a sound. felt good. And then I realized why it made that sound, because it landed right on a Lego thing that was set up. And that Lego thing was no longer set up because it exploded all over the room. We never did find all the pieces to that Lego set. It was bad. In that moment, I did not practice self-control. I recognize that there are times when it's easy for me to get tempted in this. So I make sure I don't put myself in those situations intentionally. I've talked before about making sure I don't listen to certain things. I don't watch certain things. Why? Because I know that has a tendency to get me to think a certain way, and I can't deal with those thoughts without acting on them in some way. So why would I ever do that? That's wisdom. By the way, that's self-control, turning off the radio. Sometimes that's where you practice it. Because in the moment, it's probably too late. You probably needed to practice it before you put yourself in that moment. Now, there will always be times which, in the moment, you have to practice self-control. Like Joseph getting grabbed by Potiphar's wife. And she's saying, come on, let's go. And he ran. That's in the moment self-control. But by the way, every moment is a moment to practice self-control. And he had practiced self-control all the way up to those moments. You do that consistently, you'll probably do it when the moment is right in front of you. Respectable, well thought of by others in the church community. He'll talk about that outside of the church community too. Being willing to help others in hospitality. Able to teach. Is he able to communicate the truth? And again, there's no seminary. There's no access to everything the way there is now. So is he able to communicate truth in a way that is vitally important. Moving on to the next slide. Not a drunkard, addicted to wine. Again, that's a first century substance. This is not a prohibition against drinking, by the way. Boy, that's an awkward place to pause, isn't it? You say that in some churches and it's just like, (gasps) you could suck all the air out of the room. But there are qualifications. If somebody's having a Friday night, isn't that the pastor? Those words probably shouldn't ever be said and, you know, about a pastor. And again, we have some things that might fit into that category too that didn't fit into a first century context. Not violent, not someone who hits. Uh, Ladies, by the way, This is a good list to look at for your future husband. Now, your future husband is not going to necessarily be a pastor of a church, but isn't this someone, parents, that you would love to see come calling? Something that looks like this? Grandparents, aunts, uncles? I say that because if your guy is violent before before you're married, guess what he'll do when you are? It will not get better. Um, That's free. Gentle, which is contrasted with not quarrelsome. It is the manner of disagreements. How does someone go about their lives? Okay, there's an issue. How are we going to handle this? Or, oh, there's an issue. You better get ready to rumble. Here we go. You know, and that kind of thing. What type of person is he? Again, in the context of the passage, this is all one letter. What's he talked about is the most important thing, praying, because God desires people to be saved. There's only one way. There's only one person. So men, pray with holy hands without anger and disputing. Because if your pastor's a fighter, that kind of misses the point of what Scripture teaches about the pastor. Does that mean the pastor can't have strong opinions? He certainly can. But how do you go about that? 
How do you go about those disagreements? What type of person are you in those moments? You're not caving, but you don't have to get to the point where you're throwing down. You don't have to get to the point where you're tearing someone down. You can and should respond in an appropriate way. Not a lover of money, someone who pursues stuff and wealth, someone who manages the household well with dignity, keeping children submissive, right, Chris? Yeah. (laughs) This is always fun. By the way, Chris is 19. And you you can get so lost in the weeds. You know, at what point do they stop becoming children and they start acting on their own? In some versions, it gets a little tricky because it, it almost sounds like they need to be believers. And parents can't make choices of faith for, for kids. That's just not it at all. It is how do children respond to the authority of their parents? And by the way, at any point in their life, you will have children disobey their parents. It just happens, right? I mean, we've all done it. As kids, to our parents, some of us look back with deep regret in how we conducted ourselves, but we still did it. And sometimes you can get to the point where, oh, did you see the pastor's kid today? Did you see Brennan's daughter today just running around? I was pastor of Berean Church, you know, Matt, Chris, and Beth. And pews are fun to climb over and commando crawl under, right? Some of you, you know what that's like. Are they, pastor needs to get a handle on his kids. Look at them, they're destroying the church. They're kids. This is a jungle gym to them. Like, what are they supposed to do? Here's this wonderful jungle gym. Can't play on it. You gotta sit quietly and look interested. Again, you can take this and run with this in a way that just misses the point. Do they respect the authority of their parent? Will they always? No. That's what kids do. But will they respond and follow generally, overall, to the point where you would say, yeah, he's leading his kids, his family, well. Because again, I can't choose. No one can choose. For their kids but is he leading in a way that makes it seem like he could probably lead other people well not a recent convert again this is a time in which you didn't have access to everything there was to have now paul again was he a recent convert when he started preaching in the temples and the synagogues absolutely he was he turned right around and started preaching jesus crucified paul's different But Paul also wasn't a pastor. Here, this is a context in which there's no seminary, there's no education. You got to make sure that they aren't going to get a full of themselves type of ego where they think it's all about them. And by the way, if you ever meet a guy who's full of themselves and can't wait to tell you all there is to know, that might be a flag. because that'll point to his pride, arrogance, and ignorance. Thought of well by outsiders. The gospel message is offensive. You want to make sure the messenger doesn't add to the offensiveness. And ultimately, the elder, he can't just preach the gospel. He lives it. He lives it out. And you can see it. Not perfectly, because nobody does it perfectly outside of Jesus. But When you list these qualities, and we're going to stop here because I don't want to rush into it because I'm going to step into some weeds next week when we talk about deacons and verse 12 specifically. I want you to catch this because it's important. Character matters. So I want to encourage you to do some homework for me next week. This is church, not a classroom. You're right. I expect you to read your Bible and be involved in it. Whether I'm a teacher or a pastor or a preacher, I don't think that's an unfair thing to ask of you. I want you to read 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13 because you have a business meeting coming up. It's October 15th. 
you have some positions that need to be filled here at the church. A couple of elders. You're voting on that. A deacon. Some other roles and responsibilities. I want you to look at the list that Paul has out there. And you have notes. I, I gave you those. You can use those too to look at it. But I want you to read through it. I want you to see God cares about the character of their leaders. I was a pastor at Berean for 20 years. Before I was their pastor, I was invited by someone that I worked with at MetLife. The guy, I thought, was a pagan unbeliever because of the way he spoke, talked about other people, cursed openly, talked about going out to the bars at night, and smoking on smoke breaks. Some of those things are less important than the others, but the overall package presented, he might not know Jesus. The second day I was training with him, he's like, hey, um, I want to invite you to my church. And I'm like, oh, really? Like, yeah, I'm going to be preaching this Sunday. And I said, oh, really? Tell me more. And he talked about how he had just become a deacon because the pastor had resigned just a month ago. And so they, they invited him into leadership, and now he was going to be speaking and I was like, okay, so what's the name of the church? Berean Interdenominational Church. Okay, now that's a mouthful. But for me, in the, in the traditions that I grew up with, as soon as I heard interdenominational, I was thinking, woo, one of those kind of churches? And if you're old enough to remember the movie that you shouldn't watch anyway, The Blues Brothers, okay? <laughs> Some of you are like, Oh, I know what you're talking about. There's that James Brown church scene. That's immediately what came to mind for me. You can YouTube that. That's kind of funny. Anyway, it was the down homesiest type of church you've ever been in. Oh, wait, you are in one. So you've been to what Berean interdenominational church is like. So I walked in the doors of the church. There's this old guy. His name was Bob. He's like, hey, welcome to church. How about a kiss? And I'm like, Dear Lord, it's worse than I thought. And then he gives me a Hershey's kiss. I'm like, okay, I can get used to this. The music was traditional. It was a piano and an organ. That's all they had. And, you know, they, it was just a nice little down homesy church. And then he got up to preach and he read, ultimately, what I realized was the introduction of a book called Get on the Ark or it was something like that. But the more I found out about his story and what happened... Their pastor left and left them very quickly. They had no idea he was going. Some of the elders, well, not the elders, they were deacons in that church, but they functioned as elders. They were older. They were in their late 60s, early 70s. And here was this guy who was connected with a family in the church, and he was younger, and he was in his 40s. And he seemed like he could carry himself well, even though they knew there were a couple of issues. So they had an emergency meeting. They made him a deacon. And they put him in to that position of authority. Even though he missed out on a couple of those things that it's talking about when he gets to deacons. That led to some problems. I won't tell you how it ended. That'll be for next week. But that's not the point to tell you how it ended. Some of you can probably guess how it ended because you've been a part of ministries where something ended poorly because the wrong person was in the right position. Character matters. As you think about deacons and elders and responsibilities here at the church, you're going to consider at points, we need someone. Sometimes that happens with kids' ministries. Can you breathe in and out? Cool. You're in the nursery today. We need to be people who consider the character of those we ask to serve because character matters. And if your character doesn't quite hit, by the way, 
At times, we all fall short. I want to challenge you. Work on it. Because what you are now doesn't have to be what you are. You can change. You can grow. We can all grow. We can all take the steps to improve. Because maybe in this moment, this might not be the moment. But you know what? Six months? Yeah. This is what God wanted for those who were going to serve in his church. It's his church. And he cares the most about character. He does care about their capability too. Let's not dismiss that. But God cares about character. We should too. So when it comes to these positions, think through all of that. When it comes to your own life, look closely. How would I fit if God asked me to step up? Would I be someone who could step in and serve? And if not, what do I need to address today? Because the one who desires to step into these things, it's a, it's a noble task. It's a hard one, but it's worth it. But in order to do that, you have to be the right person. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the right people in my life who made an impact in me and the way that I have tried to conduct myself since. Thankful for Pastor Marks. I'm thankful for Bob and Don and Ernie and how they didn't just live truth. They modeled it for me. They walked alongside me and helped me grow in my own character so that I could do my best to try and live up to that standard. Father, that's something that we should all strive to do. So I pray for this church as they work through who is going to lead next in the areas of elders and deacons. And even as they're considering questions greater than that, give them great insight and wisdom to be able to measure for themselves what needs to happen next and who needs to step into those roles. And God, I pray for when we fall short, give us the courage to change and grow. Help us to do that even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and join us?